it's good to be here. I'm just a, a professor in the university, um, so just a normal professor. Uh, but my work, the research that I do, is an example, you know, is sort of an exemplar of the philosophy of KAUST. So that's why I'm asked to do these presentations, because um, my work combines both fundamental research uh, with the application of that research. So I'm just an example of what we're doing here. And the power of what I do, I guess, is that we are combining discovery with delivery. And we are also addressing a problem which is an issue for the kingdom, for the region, as well as globally. But we're definitely needing to do what we do here in this region. So let me tell you about what we're trying to do and the context in which we're doing it. So there is a bottom line need to improve the amount of uh, crops that are produced on the, on the planet, and this is for several reasons, because we have an increasing population, we have an increasing wealth of that population, and there's also a very, very important issue of what's called hidden hunger, a, um, an insufficient quality of food, not just quantity of food, which is required on the planet. Uh, piled on top of this need for increasing food for both more people and wealthier people, because wealthier people eat more, um, is a diversion of foods for of, of, of what should be food, <laughs> of crops um, to f uh, to biofuels production, and this diversion at the moment is enormous and having a significant impact on on world food supplies. And uh, I don't know how much longer this is going to last. Well, personally, I consider it a perversion. I think it's dreadful, but it's what's happened. There's a political reality of this at the moment. Um, it may last for a couple more decades, so it's adding an extra pressure. On our, on our supplies. And the third aspect, of course, is that we need to be able to do all of this in the face of global climate change. Uh, climate change isn't an isn't issue of discussion or debate. It's a fact. It's an empirically observed observation. And uh, this is having a significant impact on, on, on global food production. And in fact, among all of the major human activities, global environmental change is having more of an impact on the agricultural sector than any other uh, sector of human activity. So we have to take this pretty seriously. So um, the bottom line is that we have to produce more food and we have to do so sustainably. Um, in dry land systems at least, so this is systems that are not irrigated, there are only fairly modest opportunities to increase the area of land under production. This basically means we've drained as many swamps as there are left to drain, we've cut down as many forests as there are left to cut down, and there isn't much more opportunity for expansion. Of course, there's some opportunity, but it's relatively modest and certainly not like helped drive the huge increase in food production that has occurred over the last 50 years. So what we need to do is uh, increase the plant productivity per hectare. And we need to do this even faster than previously because um, although the relative rate of increase of the human population is slowing down, the absolute rate is as fast as it ever has been ever in history. So there are, still, there are now more mouths to be fed each day than there ever have been in history. So this is a very important um, fact. And of course we need to increase this food production faster than before, in the face of global environmental change, we need to do it sustainably as well. So a lot of what we've been doing over the last 50 years has been clearly unsustainable. In particular, the massive increase in the application of nitrogenous fertilisers, um, well nitrogen and phosphorus, but in particular the nitrogen-based fertilisers, uh, their application has been enormous. And we can't keep increasing that uh, to increase food production. Um, so this is a pretty big challenge. Uh, I'm ultimately an optimist though, and so I like to say that this challenge provides us, you know, m with an opportunity, and I'm a plant guy, all right, so in many ways I'm just a simple guy, I like plants, I like to understand how plants work, and so here's a big opportunity f for me because, hey, I can do what I want to do and then hopefully be useful at the same time. And I think what we really need, it's clear, what we really need to address this uh, this Know, massive challenge uh, to increasing food production um, is, um, is, is 
is simply innovation. We have to think up some completely novel ways of addressing this problem. We can't just do what we've been doing for the last 50 years. It's impossible. And of course, universities like KAUST, universities all over the world, that's their core business. Our core business is innovation and discovery. And so we're the right sorts of people to try to address this problem. Um, two areas, uh, well, uh, sorry, I'll list three areas where we can have innovation. One uh, area is in simple fundamental plant science. We can understand how plants work more and then apply that knowledge to improving crop uh, productivity. We can also improve our ability to deliver our advances in knowledge in plant science through modern plant breeding approaches. And so nowadays, with the combination of automation and, uh, well, automation like robotics and so on, and data processing, and the amazing advances in modern genomics and genomics driving genetics, we've really got huge opportunities to, to revolutionize plant breeding. Now, I was actually on the board of a, of a, of a, of a very small plant breeding company in Australia, completely innovative, came out of, in fact, the building that I was one of the professors in, um, in Australia. I can't take the credit really for it, I was just part of this. And it was an amazingly small, dynamic, innovative plant breeding company. It was about, I don't know, 25 people in this organisation. And within a decade of that company being established, it was making a profit. This is in plant breeding, you know, this is not a profitable area traditionally. They were making a profit and they were, now, they were responsible for a third of the wheat that was grown in Australia, came from their seeds. This is from a standing start to 10 years later. And they were just using modern genomics and modern data processing and handling techniques to have this huge increase in, uh, in, 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 in the rates of plant breeding. And this is one of their field sites in this photograph here. And each of those tiny little ripples and textures that's, that's a three metre by five metre plot of land which was, had, had a unique genotype of wheat. And they, every year, were able to plant a third of a million <laughs> of those plots. Just, just a handful of people playing this massive amount. So it's a real huge brute force breeding program, incredibly impressive. And that's the sort of thing that we need. And there's a third aspect where innovation has potential, and that's with genetic modification where you insert into a single cell a single gene or a very small number of specific genes and from that cell regenerate um, new uh, genetically uh, modified crops. And there's all sorts of power with this, of course. And this is one example from my own research. It's a very poor photograph, I apologise. But it's where we've inserted a single gene that was helping the plants lock away sodium inside their cells. And this is grown on a very saline soil. It's a sort of a spectacular photograph. Scientifically, it's not, I'm not that proud of the photograph or the field trial, but doing these field trials is extremely difficult. But this is in a saline soil that was a bit too saline, so it went a bit extreme. Um, but the normal crop, which actually is a very salt-tolerant crop, it's barley, was doing very, very poorly. And then we were getting a significant yield from the genetically modified crop. Of course, we can't do anything with this because of a few concerns of a few rich Westerners who seem to think there might be some risk with genetic modification, environmental or human health risk. That's fine for human Westerners, to, West, rich Westerners to have their concerns. The concerns have some validity, I should say. But the problem is, of course, that's preventing people like me trying to help deliver that technology into developing countries. And I think that's actually immoral behaviour from the rich Westerners because that's preventing people in developing countries having a go at trying to empower themselves and try to improve their own lot. Any rate, we can talk about that later. Um, there are various areas where we can have innovation. What are the problems to which we should be focusing our innovations? And um, I think there is the top point here, I think there are limited, there are modest opportunities for increasing what we call the yield potential. That means the yield that the plants can achieve when everything's good. So think of like the, the mirror image of today's weather, <laughs> all right? So where the temperature's mild and the days are long and the sun's out and there's lots of wind and new, uh, lots of uh, water and nutrients. And so you, situations like you would find in, um, in Western Europe, where you've got incredibly good conditions for growing wheat, for example. And you can get 
10, 12, even 15 tonnes of wheat from one hectare of land. That's 15 tonnes from just 100 metres by 100 metres plot. That's amazing. But there really are fairly limited opportunities to, um, to increase that even further. Where we have massive opportunities is to improve what we call the yield stability. And by this I mean the ability of the crops to maintain those good yields when the conditions are good, when the conditions are less good. So most crops are not grown <laughs> in Western Europe with perfect water, nutrients, lights and temperature. They're grown in suboptimal conditions and the yields are reduced because of those suboptimality of the conditions. And what we would like to be able to do is reduce that reduction in yield in the suboptimal conditions. All right, and that's called yield stability. And there's an example here on this graph where some varieties, this, this x-axis is a measure of the, the, the poor quality of the site. And this is the yield on the y-axis. And you know, most crops will sort of not do so well as the, as, the, as the conditions get worse. That's fair enough. But then there are others, like this variety here, which is able to hold itself up. It's able to maintain its yield in the face of suboptimal conditions. And so the questions I like to ask is what genes are in that crop that's got this greater ability to grow when the going is getting tough? So how is that plant tougher than the normal sorts of crops? And then can we transfer those traits into the normal crops to make them tougher? What stops these plants growing so well in these conditions is all sorts of environmental abuses which are happening to the, to the plants. <laughs> Again, I refer to today's weather. I, I, my avocado plant that I'd grown from seed in my garden was just going yonk <laughs> over the last day. It's just completely wilting. You know, wind, heat is uh, something that we're suffering today. Sand blast, all sorts of things like that. Much more commonly, our uh, uh, high temperatures is, is a common widespread problem limiting crop yields. Uh, low temperature is something else as well. You may recall from your former lives, <laughs> it does get cold. And um, there are two other factors which are very important. Insufficient water supply and insufficient quality of the water. In particular, when the water is there, it's often too salty. There's too many salts dissolved in the water, in particular sodium and chloride ions, so table salt. It's often too much uh, of that in the water. And that's one of the things that we're worrying about and it's a major focus of our research here. So I refer again here to, to, semi, to, 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 to dry land agriculture where you're not irrigating the crops. And for example, in Australia where there's some very good soil scientists have been documenting this, about two thirds of the Australian crop has its yields reduced because of salinity in the soil. So it's a major impact on the Australian uh, wheat crop. That's fine, but globally, what's much more important is irrigation. And one thing you might not realise, but about 40% of the world's food is produced under irrigation. And about a quarter of that food production is, is being critically endangered by salinity because of the saltiness in the water and the build-up of salts in the soil. When you add the water that's got the salts in it, the water evaporates and the salts stay in the soil and build up and build up over time. And one of the problems, this is, a, this is not only getting worse as a global issue, but it's actually accelerating because of the unsustainable extraction of water from underground aquifers. And this has now been very, very clearly demonstrated by a huge NASA project where they've got satellites that are monitoring the depletion of subsoil water gravimetrically. And these, these are getting pretty solid, these data now, and they've been going for over a decade. And you can see most of those lines on that top right-hand corner, that graph, most of those lines are going down, <laughs> and that's <coughs> indicating a depletion of the groundwater resources. And concomitant with that depletion of the groundwater is a decrease in the quality of the water. So you get less water, the water goes down in quality. And so I'm talking about we're having to increase our food production and we're going to have to accelerate the increase over the next 50 years greater than we have done over the last 50 years. And yet here, one of our major sources of food is actually under threat. And this is critical. This really is very, very serious. So um, that's why we work on salinity. I mean, we can also talk about 
rising sea levels and sinking lands and introgression of seawater into groundwaters uh, from, um, as, as the groundwater gets depleted as well and as global environmental change is raising sea levels. This is a serious issue in, the, in, in Bangladesh. It's also a very serious issue in Vietnam in the, in the delta of the Mekong River. It's, it's a major issue. I'm getting emails from, from people worrying about what's happening in Vietnam and rice production there. Okay, but in the meantime, in the Middle East, we're right at the epicenter of saline soils globally. Uh, it's a major issue here. And uh, the other issue is, is groundwater quality. In Saudi Arabia, which is I think one of the only countries in the world where you drill for water, find oil and go, damn, oil. <laughs> so <laughs> well, we, actually have, we actually have lots of water in Saudi Arabia. You dig a hole, you'll find water, but it's usually salty. And so if only we could use a lot of that. And the same in Pakistan. There's the Thar Desert in southern Pakistan. Massive water resources underground in the Thar Desert. But it's just, it's just a bit too salty to be able to use. Ah, if only we could unlock that salty water, we'd have all sorts of incredible opportunities for agriculture. So that's what we're trying to do here. Unlock seawater. And this is just a representation of how we're using a tiny, tiny fraction of the total water that's on the planet. So about 1% of the water is used, uh, is fresh water that we're able to use. And um, probably about 3% of the water on the planet is, is fresh. But you know, a lot of it's frozen or in places that you can't access. So we really are accessing a tiny fraction of the water. And for every drop of fresh water that we use, there's another drop of water, which isn't as salty as seawater, but it's just too salty for us to use. So let's unlock that water. We can do this in cows. I'm, I'm deadly serious about this. Okay, so one of the things I want to do is to be able to irrigate salt-tolerant crops with partially desalinized seawater. This is one of the dreams that we could do because 97% of the world's water is in the sea. We can't access that at the moment. There's huge thermodynamic challenges accessing that water, of course, because there's so much salt in it. You know, there can be too much. <laughs> We've still got to obey the laws of physics here. But if we could partially desalinize seawater with technologies such as being developed in the Water Desalination Reuse Center, and if we could do this with low energy inputs, then we really have all sorts of opportunities to develop whole new agricultural systems agricultural systems that have never existed before. If we could partially desalinize seawater and then use that water to irrigate crops whose salinity tolerance has been enhanced by our plant science research. And that's the aspiration. And that's innovation. There's none of that happening in the world. So let's do it. It combines the work of a range of different research um, centers here in Calst. I think, by the way, not only do I want to do this, and to make it um, environmentally sustainable, of course, but it's got to be economic, otherwise it's not going to spread. <laughs> so you can get all the money you want from the Bill Gates or the Research Foundation, so on. we need that to prime things, but I'm really deadly serious about getting this to be economically viable as well, so then it will spread itself, then I can go and die or retire or whatever, <laughs> all right? So um, the, the economics are most likely to come out favorably First, in horticultural systems where you're working with higher value crops. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work now on tomatoes because they're actually already moderately salt tolerant. So we've got something that's already good. If we can make it better, then we might be able to develop systems, economically viable systems, to irrigate salt tolerant tomatoes with brackish water. And then, of course, when we discover how tomatoes do it, for example, and improve how they do it, then we can transfer that knowledge into the other crops. And, of course, the sums are much less likely to come out favourably for a lot longer period of time with the broadacre crops because they're such low value. So rice is worth $300 a tonne or something. This isn't a very profitable <laughs> crop at all. So it's going to be hard to make money from that. But we're going, to, we're going to work towards that aspiration. And the other way we can do things... We can do things by making a, salt, a, a crop that exists more salt tolerant. And the other way is to get a crop, get a plant that's not a crop, <laughs> that is very salt tolerant, and turn that into a crop. So one example of this is salicornia. Like, salicornia grows in, in, in seawater. So a few plants can manage it. And it's got a highly oil-rich seed. 
So let's see if we can domesticate salicornia, breed it up to make it useful so you can make money out of it and irrigate it with seawater. That's one option. Another crop that we're working on, which I think is, is really, really uh, positive, is a crop called quinoa. So it's a grain that you can buy in the supermarket. We all buy it because us rich, us rich Westerners want to be healthy and all of that sort of thing. And so we eat it because it actually has a superbly highly nutritious grain. It's the only grain that provides a balanced supply of amino acids for our diet, for example. Um, and I don't care, I mean, that's useful, but I, I'm interested in quinoa because it's incredibly salt tolerant. You can irrigate it with half seawater and the crop yields will go down by about half. That's a super crop on my side of things. The trouble with quinoa is it's grown in subsistence agricultural systems, it's hand harvested, there's all sorts of crazy things about it. It's not been commodified or industrialised. I want to commodify and industrialise the growing of quinoa because it could make a major contribution to world food production being irrigated with half seawater. So we've done things like sequence the quinoa genome, start to develop genetic resources, look at the naturally occurring variability of quinoa, and see what we can deliver to breeders. Okay, so we've got this what I call a discovery and delivery pipeline where we're trying to understand the mechanisms of salinity tolerance in plants and then apply this knowledge to increase yields. I say there of wheat, that's a mistake, that should be of crops in saline soils, not just wheat. And so we do this by using genomics and phenomics which is like a high throughput automated phenotyping of crops and we use this combined with genetics to discover the genes which are underlying these. I've just come straight from a lab meeting with my own laboratory and one of my, actually she's a young postdoc, I was going to say students, she's just started her first postdoc, she's only been with me for a couple of months and blow me down, this young woman, first lab meeting she's given <laughs> and she's already discovered a gene which is helping plants maintain shoot growth in the face of salinity tolerance. It, we're living in a very, very powerful age in biology. That's why I'm actually ultimately quite optimistic that we can address this challenge. So some really good things can happen quite quickly and now our challenge is how to use that information intelligently and efficiently. So we have to discover the basis for the differences <laughs> in salinity tolerance just like my young postdoc discovered and presented to us this morning and then use that information to generate plants which are tolerant to the salinity or have an increased tolerance to the salinity. Breed that in using these new types of, um, of genomic driven genetic selections and if there isn't sufficient variation in the gene pool of the crops that we're interested in, yes we might use genetic modification but realistically there's so much opposition I think it's, it's almost too difficult so we're trying to avoid GM now, we've been driven out of that business by the um, opposition unfortunately but we can make um, tolerant plants and then we go into field trials. So a lot of our work's now done in the field increasingly because we're trying to get from here to here very, very directly and very, very quickly. And that's possible again at KAUST because we're able to grow crops in the field here. You may be surprised to know. A lot of the time what we're doing is looking at naturally occurring variation in the crops. So here, this is actually in a field trial in Australia where there's a salty subsoil and these are different varieties of wheat in the field trial. Some varieties are doing well, some varieties are doing poorly. And the simple question I ask is what genes are in that variety which are doing well that are missing from that variety that are doing poorly? What's the difference between those two different crops? And then can we use that knowledge to help improve the salinity tolerance of the crops which um, are doing poorly. Because of course, <laughs> this is the crop that the farmers would love to be able to grow because the grain's got a really high quality and it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> Whereas this crop's sort of only useful for feeding chickens or something. So, <laughs> which also needs to be done. But, so that's the type of um, question that we try to address in our, in our, in our research. Here in um, the Middle East, it's fantastic for doing these research because it barely rains. Everything's done under irrigation. People know how to do irrigation here. And there's lots of balls which are salty. <laughs> so here we've got a field site. It happens to be in the United Arab Emirates. It's a thousand kilometers from here. And we're able to grow plants under high salinity and low salinity coming from different bores, uh, different water sources. 
and uh, we can do hand planting because you've got access to a lot of labour here as well. We're able to hand plant, hand harvest, so we can do field trials like we've never been able to do before because, the, um, because of the conditions here. And because it doesn't rain, we're, <laughs> we're able to control everything pretty well. So these are field trials that are, um, that are quite unique. And this has been done in collaboration with an organisation called the International Centre for Biosaline Agriculture, ICBA, which are in, um, who are in Dubai. However, flying for two hours <laughs> on an expensive flight to Dubai, and you know, one of my students is Lebanese, so she has to get a, part, a visa every time. <laughs> All of this is just a hassle. So if we're able to do this locally as well, that would be wonderful. At the moment, KAUS has been very supportive of us establishing a field station here. Again, fabulous things that we can do at KAUS that you can't do in most places. So we can't extend the golf course anymore. Good. We can have a field station <laughs> instead. And so um, when you go to the visitor centre, that's the KAUS visitor centre to get your pass, your pass, entry pass and so on, come out the door next. When you come out, the, look at the visitor centre and just look down to the, to the left. And that's where hopefully we'll have a field station being established over the coming couple of years. Um, we don't just talk about doing this, and we're not just in the lab. We do try to deliver this into the field. And this is one example where we've gone all the way from discovering the gene, or discovering the naturally occurring variation, all the way through to truly delivering into breeding programs. And this was a gene that we found which helps keep the salt out of the shoot. So it's sort of obvious. <laughs> intuitively at least, that if you want to have reduced toxicity of something, then you try not to take up as much of the thing that is toxic. All right? And so we found one of the genes which helps keep the toxic sodium out of the shoot. We know exactly the gene. We know exactly how it works, what the protein looks like. We've got the structure of the protein, everything. And we've been able to breed that into commercial varieties of wheat. And the great thing about this gene, this all came from naturally occurring variation, no GM, but we were able to introduce just the gene through sophisticated breeding. And when we grow this in the low salt parts of the field, there's no yield penalty. So there's no cost to the plant of carrying this gene. And then when you put the plant, this, uh, this uh, crop, into the high salt parts of the field, you get a 25% increase in yield. So you win <laughs> when the going's tough, there's no cost when the going's good. So this gene now, this material has been adopted by almost every uh, breeding program in the world for this particular type of wheat. This is pasta wheat. So when you're having your spaghetti in a couple of years' time, you will be eating my gene. All right. <laughs> Hopefully along with a few 25,000 other genes. <laughs> all right, so that's one example. And, and, and that's all good, uh, but you know, we obviously want to do a lot, lot more because there's a lot, lot more to do. And, uh, and that's one of the main reasons I came to KAUS, because it gives me the resources and the opportunities to be able to build on what we've done and really do a lot more better and faster. So that's the idea. So we're working with trying to address, in our little way, some of the, the big challenge of, of, of global food security. Um, I think that the challenges are very, very significant and very, very real, and in many ways pretty scary, actually. But... I also think that um, we can address these challenges if we really do things that are innovative and risky in universities and use the privilege we have in our university system to try to make some step changes uh, in global food production. I think we've got a lot of technological opportunities to address these challenges and, of course, also compatible with our business as a university is once we have developed the technologies, we must disseminate the technologies, in particular teach people and go into the, like I'll be in Tunisia in three weeks' time giving a course with the Borlaug Foundation um, teaching breeders in North Africa about trying to improve the salinity tolerance of their crops. And that's the sort of thing we need to do, education and training, don't just make the discoveries and publish papers in nature. So <laughs> what we're doing here is, um, is I hope, deploying, uh, developing and deploying innovative technologies. And I think with that, there is every chance that we will be able to contribute significantly to sustainable increases in food production, both in this country, in this region, and globally. So thank you all very much. <laughs>